So, uh, so today we're going to talk about field camera. We're going to set up uh, a tripod. Um, we're going to set up uh, the camera on the tripod and talk about the video aspect of uh, capturing uh, and recording as well as the audio. So we'll do it in that order. Uh, and then maybe at the end I'll have you put everything away, you know, so you can at least now watch. Uh, and I, I keep forgetting, but I'm probably going to have to face the camera a little bit. And I got my friend here, uh, Caleb, that's uh, learning how to do this. So we thank him for coming down and be a part of this uh, uh, video. We'll probably have to get a release signed by you. You'll probably want royalties and everything else on this. Um, a lot of uh, tripods are similar, even the consumer ones, the prosumer ones. Uh, these are a little bit more expensive because of the control arm and the, uh, the nice head that's on top of that thing. So uh, we just snap these out. And uh, these are like the old time galoshes, right? And just let them fall all the way out and all the way out. And then we just spread this out. And these, when they come out of the case, in theory, if they were put away the proper way, they are locked. And the two position lock is the swivel lock, which is on this left side if you're facing the back end of the camera. And that's what unlocks it and allows this to flow up. And then this lock, and I'll have to face this with the camera, is kind of not really well placed in the middle here and that locks the or unlocks the uh, panning. Now I can tell already that this was not put away properly because this head is like really crooked and and that happens because some people when they take it out of the case they forget to unlock it and they try to move the, the head and the whole thing which is really buttoned down by these three set screws will lose its you know its position. So what we first have to do when we take it out and unlock it we want to then release this head and do a bubble balance on it. And there's a bubble right there in the top. So this is lefty loosey from underneath. So it would go this way and bubble it right in the middle there. The camera can't catch it, but it's like a round circle with a bubble, just like we have for tools. And so now this is right to the earth, right? and balanced. Uh, it's good to know because if you're on the side of a hill and you're one of these things, you'd want to rebubble because you're on a, on a hill. So it's good to know and always uh, balance or bubble, bubble that thing. All right, so again, that will lock it when we put it back. We're going to collapse this down close to the legs and we're going to lock it and then lock the, uh, the pivot. But for now, we'll just let that go up. The um, tripod has two sort of braking uh, attributes to it. This big wheel here, okay. negative, will make it go like really. And then okay. to the plus side, it will sort of clamp down a little bit on it and make it a little bit less. And if you want to see how that feels to you, let me tighten this up. You know, so if you loosen, yeah, go ahead make it tighter, as tight as you want, although I wouldn't over tight it, but, okay. uh, yeah. right. And then the other one for, for uh, swiveling up and down would be to here. So if you want to do the negative and see how freely it goes, it does have a spring in there, so it will spring back to a natural position. Uh, and then the plus sign will also give you the ability to, to break it so that when you're trying to do those movement shots and you're zooming in at the same time, you can kind of control the flow between that and that. Um, obviously this can be adjusted uh, if you want to put this whole thing up another foot so there's a, in a, a thing here if you want to get over people's heads if you're in a crowd watching a football game you can put that up say another foot and you this may be out too far you can always uh, unloosen this um, and, and put it down tight or wherever you want uh, I'll keep it here for now and then put this back down Okay, in a nutshell, that's basically, and I even put a little note up here, unlock, tilt, and pan first. Again, when people don't do that and they try to ratchet this up, you know, it, it, it doesn't strip these set screws, but it just makes them less effective when we keep trying to tighten them in and, and lock this thing in. Um, as it is, this has a little bit of play, which is probably due to this. Yeah, that's better. 
Okay, so that's that for now. Now on to the camera. Camera is a Canon uh, 100, right. Um, very good camera, does a lot on its own. And the first thing we want to do is put the battery on. I just popped one off, but I want to show the camera how one goes on. So it goes into the back of this. You want to hug the top and straight down locks right in. This thing here, you push it up and out, okay? Why don't you give that a shot? See how effective my training is. Yeah, it's, you gotta get the right hands. Okay, why don't you throw it back in because we're gonna keep it in this time. All right. The camera gets mounted on this head here uh, from the back to the front, not from the front to the back. So facing the back, and you can tell the back because that's the control arm. You want to make sure that this tear-shaped knurled uh, knob is loose. And this button is sort of a release button. You want to push it in and then slide this in like that. If you release it, it will still move. It's not, it's not going to keep it in place. It's just to allow it to slide right in. And to lock it, you need absolutely, I can't emphasize this enough, but you want to tighten that, that tear-shaped uh, knob there. And then once you've got that locked in, you can go anywhere with it and not have to worry about it. All right? And then the opposite, right? So when you loosen that and then push, push that out, pull it out the back, and you'll be all set. Uh, this control arm controls, well, what we use it for, it controls a lot of things, focus and all kinds of things, but we mainly use it for, uh, you know, Zoom. zooming in. I was going to say teller, teller, what's the other word for it? Telephoto. Telephoto, right. But we use it to zoom in and out versus using this one up here. If you were to handhold this thing, if you were using your body as a, like a tri, you know, tripod or walking around with it or whatever, you could use this. Same with the record button, but the record button is this red button on here and the zoom in and out is with this thing, right? There's actually a speed control for the zoom in and out. That's what this knob on the top is. The camera can probably zoom in on that. And then this connects to this little teardrop shaped uh, cap and you open that up just like that. It runs from the battery of the camera and the reason why it's not on is because we haven't turned the camera on yet. So that's the next thing we're going to do. I'm going to tighten this up so it doesn't drop down. So this is the on-off button. The camera will probably zoom in on this thing. So it's a three-position uh, button. It's right now in the middle position, which is off. All the way forward is uh, the camera uh, record mode position. And then all the way back is playback, essentially. Because these cameras, they don't use tapes. They are, uh, there are two uh, cards in them. And I'll talk about that a little bit when I open this up. So. Um, you can tape and play them back like a VCR by selecting the various little thumbnail images that you'll see on the screen. Uh, so I'm going to turn it on, just slide it forward, right? It'll sort of boot up a little bit, and then you'll see the lights kind of come on for that control arm because it's taking the energy from that battery. And because there's no moving parts like we used to have in our old tape machines, uh, the batteries last an awful long time, uh, which is nice because you know, the only thing that's really driving the energy is anything that's lighting up and the, the LCDs or LED screen here. And that's how you just open that up. There's no button you push or something. It just opens up, you know. And, and of course, you can use it backwards and frontwards if you're in front of the camera yourself. And so um, right now, the two cards in, are, are in here. They're, they're little compact flash cards, you know, the little postage stamp size. Mm -hmm. Each one, I believe, is 32 gigabytes. And at the high resolution uh, bit rate that we have them set at, we can get 114 minutes out of each card, 
which is almost two hours out of each card. And when it exhausts one card, it automatically flips to the other card and it's seamless. In other words, you would have almost over three and a half hours of, uh, uh, you know, continual. continual if you left it on, you know, and uh, that's nice about these things. Um, so, what do we need to do next? We need to probably take the lens cap off, right? People always say, I can't see anything through that, so this just pinches and pulls right off. And now we should be able to see an image. And so if you want to, uh, this is sort of pressure sensitive too, so you can kind of, if I always leave the speed all the way up because you can kind of control the speed a little bit with how much pressure, you, so try to, try to do that back and forth, you'll kind of get the, the idea. And our camera can probably capture what's uh, going on on that screen. So you can kind of have some good control over speed. Uh, but I guess if you were zoomed way in on something and wanted to control the speed even further, you would have a dial there that you could dial down the speed of that uh, zoom, which is nice. Uh, on off for record is this red button here, appropriate color for that, although on the camera it's black, right? So if you were to hold the camera and look for a red button, you wouldn't find it. That would be the on off for the, re or the record and pause, I should say. Uh, but it's handy to do it with this one here. Uh, for this training, we recommend um, that people just take them. They're on automatic everything right now. And turn them on, and as you can see, uh, it adjusts very well on its own to, to light. If I were to shut a couple of these off, it probably would do pretty well. Um, I don't know, might, might iris up a little bit, perhaps. Well, I'm still facing. If we come over here, it might even, well, that's, yeah, look at this. If this, our camera won't see this unless I do this. But, but it's pretty dark over there, and it's already, you can see the chairs, yeah. right? So it, it works pretty well on its own. Uh, so we recommend that so people can just pull them out of the case, set them up, and go. You know, a lot of times if you're doing a football game or doing something, you just want to get the thing going. So I don't spend a lot of time on any of the manual focus or manual iris or, uh, you know, white balance and things like that. We leave them on full auto, which is that switch there. If you did want to do something with manual, just put it on manual and you can, you've got the focus ring here or you can set this to do focus. Um, and iris is just buttons and I also want to say that we do provide the little instruction book in each kit this is a kit the camera case and the tripod is considered a kit so we have the book here and as intimidating as that looks right big thick book because I can't stand reading um, surprisingly only this much is the English portion so if you had to look something up you would only have to deal with looking something up like that instead of through all of this. So, so it's kind of handy as a reference, uh, unless you love to read and try to retain, which I can't. So it's about now when I start talking about audio because I think that takes a good amount of time. Audio, I think, is always sort of um, misunderstood and, and people don't always concern themselves as much with audio because um, frankly, people figure, well, if I can hear it with my own ears, I, you know, how can it be come out bad? Well, it can because the camera comes with an onboard stereo microphone, right, which is nice, it's pointing this way. I don't recommend using that unless you absolutely have to use it. Why? Because it's sort of an omnidirectional type of mic and it will pick up everything. If you're, ta if you're getting bored with what you're shooting and you're tapping on this thing, right, you're going to be hearing tapping right into that microphone, right? If someone comes up and asks you a question, even if they're whispering, that's going to pick it up instead of the guy that's 5, 6, 20 feet away or whatever. So we don't recommend unless you absolutely have to. In some cases you can if you're just doing a close-up uh, interview with someone and you just want to break the camera out real quick. Uh, we do have little shotgun mics that actually go into this holder and you can plug it in directly. They're a little bit more effective, you know, for, because they'll, they will really be directional. So the next thing I'm going to talk about is 
using our wireless. We have little wireless kits for each of these camera kits. And uh, they look like the following. Um, there is a transmitter, which looks like, no, yeah, this is a transmitter. And right now we have the lapel mic or a lavalier mic plugged into it, such as I have on my lapel. Um, but that can be swapped out with a handheld mic. And the handheld mic, as cheap as it looks, it actually sounds extremely good. Uh, people get a kick out of it because it's almost like one of those old plastic Mr. Microphone toys, you know. Uh, but it actually has a, a great sound. Uh, the handheld is good for, you know, you're interviewing someone and you're doing the back and forth thing with them just like on the newscast. Um, the lavalier is uh, good for just you walking around, a camera guy is following you and you're just talking with your hands free. I mean, that's as basic as it gets. There are two channels um, and it comes with two channels so that if one of the frequencies is getting some interference from something, if you're near an airport or something, uh, you can just swip, switch it to the other uh, frequency on both sides, not only just the uh, transmitter, but also on the receiver side. Uh, and, and this is the uh, receiver end. And this is what receives it with its own antenna, right? So transmitting is the mic side and receiving. How does this go on the camera? Well, there's a little shoe or plate area up there, you know, where normally a flash might go, right? So you could just slide that, make sure this is kind of loosened up and that slides right in and you just tighten down that little knurled knob there, kind of stays put. They always give you more wire than you really need. I just sort of wrap this around so it's not like drooping down in front of things. And this gets plugged in to this red mini plug input. I know Mark is going to try to zoom in a little bit on that. And that's all there is for setting up that, except for what I'm about to show you. First thing I want to do is turn this on. And um, I'm going to turn it on frequency 2 because I'm on frequency 1 for this video. So frequency two, if I face this down, is all the way over, okay? And the frequencies are on the top. And with this thing here, I'm gonna put this on frequency two, and hopefully there's no, no interference. I'm getting the, the thumbs up, so why don't you hold on to that while I'm explaining a little bit about this part of it. Keep wanting to get in front of the camera here. So we have a little two-channel mixer. That's what I like to call it, right? You know, a mixing board, you can have like a nice 16-channel mixer. This is a nice two-channel mixer. I open that little cover up there, and um, we have some options. Um, the very top switchable options are A and M. A is automatic, and M is manual. We recommend uh, automatic, once again, because it will it will, um, it will limit and it will expand depending on the signal it's getting from the person, right? So it doesn't, if someone's not talking quite as loud, it might help that. And if someone's talking too much, it sort of compresses that a little. So it's nice automatic, at least for the handheld. With the lavaliers, the signal isn't quite as strong. So sometimes I don't put it on automatic. I actually use manual and I'll put this over. I won't do it now because I'm on automatic with our uh, recording. But if you use it in manual mode, M, then you can, these input gains, there's, there's, there's knurled knob volume controls, if you want to call them at the top, that you can kind of see. Our camera might be able to get in there and see that. Very, very small flat knobs that, that turn, and they're numbered 0 through 10. So obviously 10 is going to be a louder signal input than 0. And with the headset, and I'll show you where that plugs in in a moment, and with the little VU meters, uh, you'll be able to tell sort of where the sweet spot is if you do it manually. That sometimes helps. 
The next level down is a line level input versus a mic level input and a mic with a plus 48 V, 48 volts. Line uh, level is, you know, like instruments, like if you plug the keyboard in or something like that. Mic is obviously mic. We typically always have them on the mic setting. The mic with the plus 48 volt is for microphones that need power. We call that phantom power. So we give it 48 volts of juice through this battery, right, in order for the microphone to, to have power. Um, not really used that often unless we plug in a uh, microphone through these XLR connections um, that require phantom power. These particular wireless don't. So that for the wireless, they can be on the mic setting. The next one down is internal versus external. Internal is this uh, microphone that's built into the camera and it's also what you plug into this thing. It's confusing because these XLRs are for external microphones, right? A, a, a mic cord essentially plugs into that and you would think, well, if, some, if something gets plugged in there, why wouldn't that be external? But it's not. It's considered, if I'm not mistaken, Mark, this is considered uh, an internal mic, even though we're plugging something in externally. Um, but, and we'll talk about this in a moment. So those are for, you know, which type of audio you're going to go with. And so right now, for our purposes, this is internal. If we were to, uh, if we were to use uh, a, an external mic, I'm just going to walk over here for a quick second, um, and we grab a, uh, you know, just a standard uh, uh, mic. This is a Shure microphone, what we call a 57 Beta, kind of a good workhorse type microphone. Any length cord you want, you know, we essentially could plug this in to the. XLR up there, the left channel or the right channel. It is a left and a right channel up there. It's a two channel mixer, like I said, it's like a little mini mixer. And this into the, uh, the microphone. And you could hardwire yourself into the camera um, at any length. And uh, the beauty is it's a solid signal. You know, you wouldn't get any interference. Uh, you wouldn't, have, not that these do, but I mean, sometimes you might have to hardwire yourself in to get a better. Uh, signal and so you have that opportunity to do it. The downside is obviously you got all this stuff that people are going to trip over. So um, thank you. <laughs> I should shut mine off too. Um, so that's that's the external uh, connection for for the mic. So you essentially have three different ways to go. Actually four. You know you can go with the hardwired thing. You can go with a shotgun mic. I don't have one here now, but it goes into this connection here and just plugs into that. Same concept as a regular mic, except it's it's very directional. Um, and then you've got the wireless that goes into this internal plug. So you have to set it on internal. And then you unplug this and you can have these activate. It, as long as something is plugged into that, these will not be live. Okay. They will shut off immediately when you plug uh, something into that port. So every kit has headphones. You know, We try to keep our kits together. This is Camera Kit 4. Camera Kit 4 is labeled under there. Um, standard headphones. I think it's important, just like Mike has put, I mean, Mark has put his headphones on, that even though you can visually see how the audio is going on your screen, and I want to say that the, free, the, the nice sweet spot where you want to end up is close to 10. So, you know, that's kind of where we like it to be. Um, we also like to hear how it's going in there. So let's plug this in. Where does this plug in? Well, there's a little rubber flappy door here on the back end of it, right? Mark will probably want to zoom in a little, try to get that. It's kind of hard to see. There's a silver hole, there's a yellow hole, and then there's this hole that has a thing in the middle and it's black. Um, the silver is obviously for this headphone jack. Um, the uh, yellow is for video, um, Output, I believe. Yes, Mark, video output. Yes, he's giving me the, yes, it is. 
And the far right one, which we'll get into in a moment, is uh, external power. Because if you're going to do something for three days in a row, you may want to start thinking about charging the battery or using a direct connection to AC power. Put these on, you can hear yourself. Surprisingly, that microphone, that plastic, cheap-looking microphone is, is a very warm uh, directional mic. It's very close sounding. Now, talk one, two, three, just do some talking. One, two, three. I'm going to unplug that system and go with just this external or this internal camera mic, right? Big difference, right? Sounds roomy, yeah, not as close sounding. So you kind of get a feel for, well, I think I'd rather go with that if I'm interviewing people or the lavaliers. So I'll plug this back in and all of a sudden it will sound, you know, if you want. Yes, testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. My wonderful voice sounds very close and sounds warm and, and, uh, and not sort of hollow and ambient and everything else. So. For, for, you know, something that looks like that, they actually do pretty well. And they've got a pretty good range, too. I mean, you could walk, I could probably walk down to the men's room and you'd, it'd still be like as if I was right in front of this camera. So you can see by looking in the viewer that, you know, if I'm standing here and I'm doing that newscast that I know you're dying to do, uh, visually it looks good and I got the good audio. And audio, I think, is just as important, if not more important. You can have a great image, obviously, but if it has poor audio or weak audio or, or, or lousy audio, um, it really makes the whole viewing experience awful. So really pay close attention to audio and try different things. We encourage people to take the camera out, take it home, play around with it, shoot some things, kind of play it back, listen to it, uh, play with these things or the, or the onboard mic or whatever and see the differences. Okay, let's talk about, any questions about audio? Yeah. Um, oh, good. Um, these two knobs for the, the manual audio, um, is there a difference? So it's a two channel Okay, so it's a two-channel two -channel, uh, system, yet I'm using only one channel to capture the single microphone that we have. Okay. Okay? And uh, that's why right now you see channel one is the only thing okay, that's bouncing so, around. So one's for one channel and the other not. Yes. The other. If we had okay. two things plugged into here instead, you could control manually the signal in on those separately. And, and it's important to know that because if you wanted to edit your show and have something on the extreme left side of, uh, of a speaker system, you know, a stereo system, and then have something on the extreme other side, you know, you want to have separation of the recording tracks um, for people that want to have that. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't really matter. We broadcast in mono, you know, from here. Um, someday that might change. But, um, but the mere fact that we're capturing it both visually looking at it and trying to be in that little sweet spot between 20 and 10 um, is where you want to be. And if you can't quite get there and, it, and you can't quite hear that it's there and it's very soft, I would switch it to, to uh, manual okay. and then adjust. And, and, and the adjustment up is, is, is significant. You know, you just adjust it two or three you know, numbers, and it's like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm getting it now. So it really does help to have that manual setting if you need it. Uh, I have found that, again, with the uh, microphone, it, it self-adjusts very well, uh, no matter where you hold it, as long as you're not holding it 20 feet away from your source. But these close uh, lavaliers, by nature, have a slightly weaker signal output. And that's where I would typically when I'm using these things, I would, I'm tapping, he's probably getting in his ears, uh, switch, switch it over to manual, uh, especially if I'm outside or something, and actually kind of pump it up a little, little higher. So, okay. uh, But yes, two channel, that's, that's the reason why there's two sets of everything there, two knobs for the manual input. Good question.
Any other questions with uh, audio or video? Oh, not at the moment. Okay. So, the last thing we want to talk about is power. So, you know, the battery, it's a pretty hefty battery. It can last an awful long time. I don't know, Mark, I think, told me, I don't know, probably three hours or so. Yeah. I mean, there's just no moving parts. I mean, batteries just can really, you know, uh, and that's wonderful, right? I mean, I suppose if you kept this open, that might be draining the battery more so than keeping it closed and looking through the viewer. Now, if you're doing an outside shoot, Sometimes it's hard to actually see the image on the screen because sunlight and everything else bleaching that out, you can't really see it. A lot of times you'd close it up and actually look through the eyepiece. It's a lot better, you know, for outside use. But inside, keep this open and, uh, and, and use that. So the power, if you had to, it's a dual system. Um, the uh, part that plugs into your AC outlet, plugs in there, and, and if you plug that into the, the AC outlet, you can uh, actually charge your battery up, right? Okay. So it's the little metal uh, contacts that slide onto these metal contacts from, from the back here. Okay. Like, so that's different from the camera, because on the camera you start from the top and that, down. That's right, unless you, you, unless you want to call this the top. Oh, yeah. Um, but you're right, it is different. You kind of have to, I never put this on here very often, so. So, okay. and, and you'll see it, you know, light up, uh, and it tells you kind of little indicators of how it's charging, what the status is, and then when it's fully charged. Um, but it also serves as an AC adapter, right? So I'm gonna pull this off and uh, not drop it. And I'm gonna unwrap this thing. Looks like what I did. And uh, either side works on either end. So that just plugs in there, right? And then this little door, again, I'll face this towards the camera and I'll get out of the way. And that goes into that furthest one on the right, which is that black uh, input, right? So you plug that in and you can go for years, right? Um, you can't charge, I don't believe you can charge the battery at the same time as running this. Yeah. And not that you'd want to, but I guess if you had two batteries and say, oh, I'll charge one while I'm running the show plugged into the outlet. I don't know, I've never tried it. I guess, no, you have, no. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure. Maybe you can. It would be nice if you could charge a battery if you had a, yeah, while you're, you know, and then when it's fully charged, you just take it off and plop it back on. Anyhow, so that's how that works. Um, pretty much I've covered uh, what I've wanted to cover. In the kit, in these pouches, there's extra uh, batteries. These take 9-volt batteries. The uh, transmitter and the uh, receiver take 9-volt batteries. They open, uh, you know, like a standard little door here. And there they are there, so... We keep a couple extra batteries for that in there. Um, you know, if you take a camera out, you may want to take not only one of these. We keep them fully charged before the cameras go out. So when the cameras come back, we put them on the charger right away. When they're fully charged, we put them on the table and then we, someone takes the camera out, we give them one at least, obviously, but sometimes, oftentimes, we give someone an extra battery. Not that you'll need it, but it can't hurt to have an extra battery. Uh, How long can someone Um, well, we have, uh, you know, if you're doing something over the weekend and you think you can get it back the following Monday, that's nice. Um, if you've got a couple things going on and, and, and you don't want to take, you know, bring it back on the Monday just because you, and you got to bring it, take it again on Wednesday to do something for Thursday or Friday, we'll let you have it for the week. I mean, it's kind of like a library book. So we had one producer who actually, we don't do this a lot but we had one producer actually take one down to Florida. She was actually shooting material for her show in Florida, you know, and she had it for a couple of weeks, you know, and, and that was acceptable. Um, we've only, we've got eight of these cameras, and that sounds like a lot of cameras for people to use, but we have a lot of producers too. And we also, BevCam does productions outside of the school with our portable switching setup which often requires three or more cameras to use with that switcher. So 
Um, it's a good question, but typically people take them out for a few days and bring them back. It's that simple, you know. But if you've got, you know, a bunch of things going on, you're going to need it for a week and a half. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're pretty flexible. You know, you've got to fill out a little piece of paper and sign your name on it so that if you do end up going to Europe with it and we don't hear from you for about four years, we can at least uh, say that we had your signature on this paper. Um, <laughs> Um, I think that's it. I'm going to ask my cameraman, Mark Lehman, who's been so patient videotaping all of this. Oh, I said videotape, video recording, <laughs> video recording this. Um, if there are any questions, Mark, did you think I left much out of this? I don't think you left anything else. The next part of this training is to have you completely dismantle all this. Okay. Um, appropriately, you know, I know you're not going to do things in a certain order that I showed you when we did it, but I want you to also remember how we take the camera off and how we lock things and put them back in the bags and whatever. As far as where things go, the camera basically goes in that large compartment and wherever other things fit. We don't have uh, specific areas, but wherever they fit well enough. So with that, it's the camera is still on and the lens cap is still over here. Not to give you any hints, but um, you can now have at it. And I'm going to step out of the picture. This is always the true test. Someone who can put the thing away. Extremely important. A lot of people forget to turn the devices off and uh, when the next person takes the camera, uh, the wireless kit doesn't work and they uh, have to change the battery out. So that was uh, very good that you did that. Ah, yes, very good. Smart good. person. I think he's going to teach our next class. Okay. Now the camera. Okay. One thing. One little demerit. Yes, so we have a check. Well, that, no. yeah, yeah, you can take that out, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. I'm missing you are. Look, look on the table of your, your little, there you go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Push that in? Yeah, it just, it just pushes in, yeah. Very good. I think he did that on purpose to see if the <laughs> trainer would pick up on it. Now, um, so very good. Down, lock it up. Well, that's not the lock. That's for operational. Oh, this is. That's right. This is the lock. Yes. Okay, and that's to the pan. Right? No, that's for the up and down that's locking. Up, yeah. The okay. pan. I won't tell you where it is, even though I just pointed to it. Pan is. No. no. Nope. It's in an awkward, weird place where your fingers have trouble. Turn it all the way around, 180 degrees. Oh, ah, yes. Ah. Kind of in an awkward place. There you go. Yep. Yeah, and what I use, I flip it upside down. You let nature, let yeah. gravity, uh, when, you, when you undo those little buckle things, let gravity Push them down for you. Let, let gravity do the work for you. Yeah. There you go. Excellent. Well, we had already, yeah, well, we had already, that's, that's for this thing going 
up and oh, down to give us that extra down. 10 inches of okay. top. So we've already, we've already put, it put it down. It was down because I had okay. put it up and then I had put it down. Okay, and then, oops. Let's see. Right. It's important with these spaces. A lot of people just throw it in the bag without the spaces. I think it's important to have the leg space because it just, it just locks the whole tripod in a particular position with the handle down, snug next to the legs, the legs evenly spaced. So, because the, the bag itself is tapered, right? So obviously the small end, the feet end, will go in there and the, and the, the bigger side will go there and, and it just, you know, it just makes for, I don't know, more appropriate packaging up of the tripod. Okay. And then we have now this microphone. Yep. So all of these things, except for this that I brought out for the external mic, actually go into the camera case. And again, the important thing is that the camera goes in the, the big area and wherever, well, what I do, how would you, would I, you wrap it? Good or? question. I, I, I would wrap it. And, I, and maybe this is not totally etiquette, but I use the headset itself, you know, as a, as a spool, you know, to, to kind of wrap it up. We get a little close. We just kind of throw the end piece in the middle to kind of hold it in place. And that way it's just like that. And this just plops right on top. But the other things you may want to, you know, kind of, you know, disconnect the mic, right? And so this thing here can go in a, you know, one of these little pouches, the one that's similar in size. You know, we could put that right next to it. There was some logic when we put the little spacers in there. Yep, that works. The big, the big stuff like that, you may want to disconnect the wires and kind of scroll them a little bit and then that kind of thing. Would you want this sure, also disconnected? Sure, sure. Okay. Can't hurt because then that way this fits better in its own little place. And then the wires when you can just kind of go down beside them. That uh, lavalier can go in any, any available. Yeah, anywhere is fine. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. yeah, very good. And of course the batteries, you know, we can leave them out for now, but it, when you're bringing it back, make sure you bring the batteries back. We take the battery. So the routine, when, we, when you bring the camera into us, the media that's on those cards is your responsibility. We have nothing to do with it. We don't want any, you're the owner of it, okay? Not the owner of the card, but owner of what's on the card. So when you bring the camera back, we kind of check, make sure everything's in there. We put the batteries on the charger right away. That's our process. And we take the cards out and we ask you, what do you want to do with this media? There's a lot of files here. They're computer files, right? So they're raw media for, for video and audio. So uh, oftentimes uh, we offer a, a hot external hard drive that we can create a folder on that hard drive and put the raw material on it for you. Oftentimes you might have your own little uh, USB drive that you buy at Staples, you know, for 50 bucks and put the media on there and work on the project at home. Um, we offer the editing, which I think you're going to take a little one-on-one -on -one course with me after you do some sh shooting and, and, uh, and we'll work. It's always best to do some of that training with, with video that you've taken. Uh, then we'd put it on a hard drive here at the, but a lot of, uh, some of our folks like Mark, you know, he's got his own drive. He takes his own media. He's in control of it. We cannot be responsible for that media and you know, we get enough of our own to be responsible for. So. Yeah. You own it, BevCam doesn't, it's your show, you're the producer of your show. Um, so that means you need to control that, whether it's on our hard drive. And if you keep filling up our hard drives, we'll come after you after a while and say, look, you know, you've got 800 gigabytes of raw files here, you know, you need to clean house or offload it or put it on your own media, because we're not going to obviously keep buying drives for people. But so we, it's sort of a self maintenance thing and people are pretty responsible about it so uh, so that's the drill when the cameras come back okay. and we in, we really encourage having a lot of fun with them they're pretty roadworthy and not that you can throw it off of one story building and you know but you know they're for people to to get what they have to get done at a fairly you know you're not going to want to take one of these cameras but back in the day this camera would have gone for about twenty five thousand dollars and even though you can mount it on your shoulder and carry it around with you 
these are a great uh, high definition camera to do everything you want to do over and above these things in many cases uh, in, in two small cases you know if you wanted to do a multi camera shoot you'd want to take out two cameras you know and, and synchronize them together and we can talk about that if you want to get into that it's not really part of this training so you've had the basic rundown you've uh, seen how we set them up and get them going you've packed it up yourself now the next thing is I would highly recommend taking it out sometime before you do a legitimate one take it home and uh, go around the kitchen and, uh, and, and whatever you want to do with it and just sort of get to know it on your own without someone like me hanging around. Yeah, practice first. Though. Yeah. Okay. All right, questions? No, I, I think for now, I, yeah, I'll probably have some more later. Okay, and that's natural. <laughs> After I play around with uh, The effectiveness of this training for the camera, the people at home, what would you, on a scale from zero to 10, 10 meaning the most uh, effective training you've ever had in your life, zero meaning this thing was really bad, right? Yeah. What well, would you I, say? I Come was, honestly. I thought it was excellent. I thought it was clear uh, and concise, and yeah, I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> I love it. What a, people are going to think we, uh, we set this up. So, Okay, very good. And uh, it's just a matter of zipping. I always do this sort of detail. They must put these things on here for a reason to keep things together. And um, uh, I can just quickly sign off to our viewers out there. We want to thank you very much for watching this training on specifically the tripod and the Canon cameras that we uh, lend out for field work. And we thank you very much. We'll see you next time.